Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Robin McDonald, and I'm here with my colleague, Devin Marr. And today we are going to talk to you about the wonderful world of WSIB and right to sue applications. Uh, but before I do, I just want to introduce our firm. We are SBA. And for those who you don't know, we are an insurance defense firm. The offices in Toronto, London, and Waterloo. We specialize in tort law, both MVA and non-MVA, accident benefits, privacy and cyber law, and subrogation. Um, if you have any questions throughout the uh, presentation, please put those questions in the Q&A box, which is uh, to your screen below in, in the chat box, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the, of the presentation, if time permitting. Also, a recording of this presentation will be made available online in a couple of days. And if you want the slides of this presentation, just send us an email to either me or Devin, and we'll be happy to send them along. So without further ado, let's get this presentation started. All right. So the principal legislation to the WSIB scheme is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act, or what we call WSIA, or I might call it the Act as well throughout this presentation. It's, uh, if you're familiar with the SABs, it's much like the SABs, but for injured workers. And like the SABs, the WSIB is a no-fault system. Um, so in exchange for receiving benefits, a worker forgoes their right to commence an action against certain at-fault parties. Um, this is what, in the biz, we call the exchange, this exchange of rights is usually called uh, the historical trade-off. Uh, so determining whether an injured employee or worker has a right to sue an at-fault party is largely what insurers and defense counsel concern themselves when it comes to the SIB, WSIB. Next slide, please. So if you have a BI claim or an AB claim and one or more parties are working or in the course of employment, then you should probably ask yourself, is this case ripe for a right to sue application? Now, you probably won't ask yourself that question if you don't know what a right to sue application is. So I'm, I'm here to tell you. Uh, under Section 31 of the WSIA, insurers or defendants can apply to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeal Tribunal, which is called, also called the WISIAT for short, or the Tribunal, to determine whether a plaintiff's right of action against the defendant is taken away. Next slide, please. Um, so section 28 of the WSIA lays out the conditions that must be satisfied in order to bar a plaintiff from commencing an action. Uh, these conditions are threefold. First, the plaintiff must be a worker for a Schedule I or Schedule II employer. Two, the defendants are either Schedule I or Schedule II employers or are workers or executive officers of Schedule I or Schedule II employers. And three, the workers involved in the action must be in the course of their employment at the time that the injuries were, were sustained. If you meet all three of these conditions, then you will have a, a successful right to sue application before the tribunal. Next slide, please. So a very common issue uh, that we deal with in right to sue applications is determining whether a party is a worker or an independent operator. And this distinction is important because for the most part, independent operators do not require WSIB coverage and therefore they are not covered under the act and therefore can bring an action in court against an outfall party. Um, so generally speaking, uh, workers and independent operators can be distinguished along the lines of their respective contracts. Uh, a worker has a contract of service, an independent operator has a contract for service. And uh, a contract of service usually resembles an employer-employee relationship or a contract for service usually resembles a business relationship between the employer. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this slide, I, I prepared a table that compares the different factors that a tribunal will consider when determining whether a plaintiff is, or a party is a worker or an independent operator. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through them all, but if you do want to take a deep dive or take a closer look, 
again, you can just ask us for the slides and I'll send them to you and you can go through them all and, and, and check if you have a case, you can see whether or not any of these apply. Um, what you should know about these factors, there are many of them. I have another slide with another uh, set of factors as well. But what you should know about them is that none of these factors in and of themselves are determinative, determinative of status. Um, the tribunal takes each case uh, on its own set of facts and each case is very fact, fact specific. But um, if you wanna take a general approach to these things, the tribunal will in general find that a plaintiff is or a party is a independent operator if they find that the party has a separate business that is not integrated into the employer's business. And conversely, if the factor suggests that the uh, party is subject to a high degree of control from the employer, either by you know, what type of work they do, when they work, or how they're paid, and the, the party has little opportunity to earn a, a profit or a loss based on the decisions they make while working or the activities they do while working, then the tribunal will usually find that that party is in fact a worker. So uh, just those, General concerns are what, are what you should be generally uh, informed about in terms of figuring out whether someone is an independent operator or a worker. You can skip to uh, the next slide to the exception, please. Okay, so like everything in law, there is an exception. And uh, this the exception that we're talking about here is that independent operators are generally not required to have WSIB coverage. However, if they are working in the construction industry, then they are required to have uh, coverage under the WSIB. And essentially what uh, section 12.2 uh, does is that they convert all the independent operators that are working in the construction industry into deemed workers or deemed employees. So that allows them to fall under the language of section 28. And what that means is independent operators working in the construction industry may not be able to bring a right of action against a section schedule one or they're not allowed to bring an action against a schedule one employer or a schedule two or a schedule one employer or a schedule worker or schedule one um, executive officer. Next slide, please. Now, like I said, in law, there's always the exception and there is the exception to the exception. Um, and that exception is that independent operators who perform home renovations are not required to have WSIB coverage, even though home renovations would technically fall under the construction industry. Uh, now, this exception applies if and only if the independent operator performs the work uh, he can he or she cannot have any employees, but they can hire subcontractors or other independent operators to perform other work um, on on a specific site. So if you hired if a homeowner hired an independent operator to build a deck and then they wanted the side of their house painted, if the independent operator hired a subcontractor, then the exemption still applies. However, if they get one of their employees or hires an employee to do the painting, then the exemption no longer applies. Um, another factor that has to be considered is that the work has to be on a private residence. This of course includes a house, a condo apartment. It also includes ancillary things to the property like garages, fences, sheds, swimming pools, um, as well as the final factor that in order for the exemption to apply is that independent operator must be directly retained by the occupant of the residence or a family member of the occupant of the residence. So um, this home renovation exemption would not apply in cases where um, a person is, is buying a house in order to flip the house or to turn the house into a, an investment property or to lease it out to a tenant. Next slide, please. Now, as I said before, the second condition of a right to sue application is that you must prove that uh, the defendant is either a schedule one or schedule two employer or a worker and executive officer of a schedule one or schedule two employer. Now schedule one and schedule two employers are listed on regulation 175.99. And in January of 2020, this regulation was amended to expand the class of schedule one employers from nine classes to 16 classes. Uh, now, as you can see, the list of industries is quite expansive. 
covers a range of industries from agriculture to leisure and hospitality. Um, and you can consult the, the regulation itself, but it doesn't go into that much detail. Um, I, I would more prefer, to, or I would rather look at the employment classification manual, which we will get to in a couple of slides. Next slide, please. So uh, schedule two employers, they differ than schedule one employers. Uh, we usually don't see them in our line of work simply because there's not as many schedule two employers as there are schedule one employers. But what they are is essentially public entities that consist of governments and government run corporations and organizations. And they differ from schedule one employers on the basis that they are self-insured. Whereas I said before, schedule one employers pay into a collective fund that is administered by the WSIB um, itself. Next slide, please. So as I said, here's some helpful resources in determining whether an employer is a Schedule One or a Schedule Two employer. Um, like I said, the regulation is not that detailed. Um, it can give you kind of a stepping off point, but I would go uh, first to the employer's classification manual, which is on the WSIB website. This is an online source. Um, it provides descriptions of what industries and subclasses are considered to be Schedule One and two, Schedule Two employers, and it also tells you tells you which employers are not covered by the act or are not required to have mandatory coverage. Um, another another way of determining whether someone has a whether an employer has status with the WSIB is doing a clearance certificate search. Again, this is also done online, um, and you can just type in their details and it will tell you whether or not the employer is registered with the WSIB. And lastly, you can always email the WSIB and they will advise you on whether the employer in question is registered with them. Uh, one thing you should note that if you do uh, go through the clearance certificate um, search, or if you email the uh, WSIB is that even if the employer is not registered with the WSIB or was previously registered with the WSIB, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a Schedule One employer. Um, there are many delinquent employers who are not registered with the WSIB, even though they should. And the reason for it is that they're simply just trying to avoid paying the premiums for the uh, insurance policy. Next slide, please. So uh, what to do if an employer falls under more than one classification? So uh, in, in these cases, there are some times where an employer may fall under an industry that is covered by the WSIA and is a Schedule One industry. Um, and, and in some cases, it may also fall under uh, industry that's not covered by the WSIA. And so for, for our purposes, the, the tribunal will decide that there has to be one classification. Uh, there cannot be multiple classifications and an employer can't fall under different uh, heads of industry. So what the tribunal will do when determining what classification should be, uh, should be put on it and on an employer that they do the best fit test and th this doesn't mean necessarily mean that the, uh, the classification has to be a perfect fit to that employer, rather it just has to be the best and most appropriate uh, fit to classification for the employer. Um, a uh, example of this can be seen in the decision from 2005, numbered 611. Um, in this case, uh, the plaintiff was a summer student working for the Optimist Club when he was involved in a motor vehicle accident with a coworker at the time of the accident, they were coming back from cutting grass in a park and they were in the course of their employment. Uh, the plaintiff was injured in the accident and he sued his coworker. The defendant coworker then brought a right to sue application before the tribunal. And at the time, the Optimist Club was not registered with the WSIB. So the issue before the tribunal was whether the Optimist Club was a Schedule One employer within the meaning of the act. So the de de defendant argued that since the plaintiff was involved in cutting grass for the Optimist Club, the Optimist Club itself was engaged in the landscaping industry, which requires compulsory coverage under the WSIA. And therefore they deemed the Optimist Club to be a Schedule One employer. However, the tribunal disagreed with the defendant's position holding that the Optimist Optimus Club's uh, landscaping operations were merely complementary or incidental to the Optimus Club's overall primary business activity 
performing charitable, social, and recreational activities. Most most charitable organizations um, are not required to have WSIB coverage. However, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, they don't, they don't, they're not mandatory to have actual coverage. So according to the tribunal, they indicated that the incidental landscaping operations of the Optimus Club did not change how the Optimus Club's business was viewed for WSIB purposes. So here the tribunal is taking a holistic approach when determining what industry classification classification best fits the employer in question. So just because some of the employer's business activities fall within industries covered by the, the act, it does not necessarily mean that the employer is a schedule one employer. If their primary activities do not fall within the schedule one classification. So I'll now hand over the uh, presentation to my colleague, Devin Marr. Thank you. Thanks, Ryland. So we will power on through here. Uh, before we go on, one thing I always like to comment, going back to Ryland's comment about workers and independent operators, is that the tribunal doesn't necessarily care what people call themselves. Someone might call themselves an independent operator, but in reality, they might be a worker. So when you've got a file and someone says they're an independent operator, uh, don't always take them at their word. You want to look at those criteria that Ryland mentioned uh, to, to get a sense of what's actually going on. And, and with that, I kind of want to talk about uh, the course of employment, which is that third element you have to sort of satisfy uh, in order to determine if there's coverage. So course of employment, uh, it's, in the, uh, it's in the act and you're eligible for benefits if, again, you're a worker, you are a schedule one or schedule two employer or a worker of that employer, and you're in the course of employment at the time the accident happens. And when we're talking about course of employment, uh, the, the board, which has a policy manual out, really looks at three main things. You know, it is time, place, and activity. And so time is pretty straightforward. It's usually, are you on the clock? You know, if you have a nine to five job, accident happens at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, satisfies time. Place, uh, again, it's just looking at where did the accident happen? Uh, did it happen when you were physically at work? You know, are you a, a grocery stalker and you slip and fall uh, while you're you know, stocking shelves at the property? You know, that, that would be the place, you're, you're at your workplace. Uh, and then there is activity. You know, what, are, what are you actually doing at the time of the accident? So you, know, you can have cases where someone's on the clock at the job site, but if they're engaged in an activity that is wholly unrelated to their work, there won't be coverage. Um, and so when you get a file and you're, you're looking at something that comes along, you know, time, place, activity, it's often pretty straightforward. I'm a cashier, I'm working at my job site, I slip and fall um, while I'm stocking something. But these aren't really hard or fast um, rules. There, there are certain exceptions, you know, some people's jobs uh, may not actually have a, a set workplace. You know, if you're on the road a lot as a transport driver or, you know, a courier, well, your, your workplace is, you know, your car or where, where you're driving. Uh, again, you know, so you have to be, take a bigger view of, of what place really means. Uh, same with time, you know, not everyone has a nine to five job. Uh, maybe, maybe you have uh, inconsistent work shifts or you have to do some overtime. You know, these are things you have to look at and, and same with activity. You know, you might be, uh, you know, a, let's say a stalker, you know, it's nine to five, uh, you're, you're at Loblaws, but for some reason you need to go drive across the street to go pick something up for your work. You know, that's part, not part of your normal job duties, but it's still, you know, related to your job. And so you have to look at that activity. Uh, and so just because someone says, oh, I wasn't at my workplace or I wasn't on the clock, you know, doesn't necessarily mean uh, the act doesn't apply. And the reason I, I want to talk about that is we want to talk about, you know, activities that are reasonably incidental uh, to the activity, because, you know, you have this question, you know, what if someone gets injured off the site, you know, what does the act apply? 
and it's going to be incredibly fact dependent. Uh, there are, you know, about 10 plus factors and they're all different. Uh, and each case, you know, they, they weigh them some more than others, depending on, on the, the unique case. Um, but, and I want to give an example. So I have these two cases on the, the slides here. And unfortunately for WSIB or the tribunal decisions, uh, they don't give you a name. It's always just the decision number slash whatever year it was decided. So the first decision, you know, we have a, a slip and fall. Uh, the, it, it was, you know, uh, an employee, they worked nine to five, they had finished their job uh, and they were in the employer's parking lot waiting to be picked up um, by their friend to, to go home. Uh, as she's leaving, she slips and falls and gets injured. In that case, the tribunal found that there wasn't coverage uh, for work because she was her work hours were done and she was essentially waiting around to be picked up. And that activity was not reasonably incidental. But then a couple of years later, uh, in 2020, we have this other decision, uh, you know, 1375, similar facts, different outcome. In this case, uh, the person was a manager. They, they worked at, I think, a grocery store. Uh, they, they had a regular shift, you know, nine to five, essentially. They got paid for the time they were on the shift. Um, they got a flat rate. There was no overtime. Uh, at, after five o'clock, he left the job site, but he then went to one of their vendors to, to deal with some work-related issues. Whole thing takes about half an hour leaves the shop of the shop completing what he's done he slips and falls on his way to his car and he gets injured in that case uh the board found there was uh coverage because even though he was off the clock or he, you know it was outside of his regular hours it wasn't on the workplace um and they found that the activity was still reasonably incidental because he was you know doing his managerial duties you know, above and beyond to make sure things were okay. And so, you know, these two cases kind of highlight that just because someone's not in their regular time or they're not in their regular place doesn't necessarily mean that the act doesn't apply. So you always want to, you know, take a, a closer look and maybe do a little bit of a deep dive, especially if someone's like a manager or they have, you know, duties that take them away from their, their main area. And, you know, speaking of, away from your main area. You might have cases where there could be coverage if someone's staying overnight. You know, in Ontario, you might have logging or heavy industry where someone goes up for, you know, three weeks and spends time in a camp uh, doing, doing work. And the, the tribunal has generally found that if someone is, you know, traveling for work, and this honestly could be for a convention as well, you know, if you're, you're back when people traveled for in-person conventions, you know, you're, you're being sent by your employer, they're paying for your hotel room. And if you are injured, you know, during your stay, uh, you, there may be coverage. And the activity, again, has to be related to work and it has to be sort of your, your basic necessities of life. So if you're going to get food at the local rest, like the restaurant that's down downstairs or even another restaurant, as long as it's sort of nearby, you know, there could still be coverage because you know, you're essentially on a work trip. Now, you know, they won't cover things like going to a cocktail lounge, which was from the policy manual, or, or going to see a movie or other personal activities. But you know, things like work dinners or you know, your boss is taking you out or you're with a client, you know, those could be something that could fall under the act. So again, you kind of have to think, a little bit broader when you're thinking of time, place, activity. You know, it's not just limited to someone who is, you know, stock and shelves at Loblaws or, you know, they're just driving around doing deliveries, you know, normally. And I wanted to touch really briefly on um, SABs and, and the election. I know a lot of our audience uh, does a lot of accident benefits work. Uh, for those of you who don't, and when we say SABs, we mean statutory accident benefits. Um, and essentially, what will happen when you have someone who is, you know, in in the course of employment, you know, they're a worker, they work for Schedule One or Two employer, and they were in the course of employment, they will usually get an election. They can either 
take uh, WSIB coverage and, and get benefits through that, or they can elect to sue the person you know, in, in negligence. And this is usually for MBAs, I should say, you know, if someone's involved in a car accident, um, you, you can elect between the two. But what you can't do is you can't just elect to get accident benefits. You know, uh, and so if someone is involved in you know, a single car accident um, or there is another employee you know, or they, they have their right to sue taken away because the at-fault driver or, or whoever it might be uh, was an employee of a Schedule 1 employer or a Schedule 2 employer, uh, or you know, potentially where the accident is 100% at fault, you, know, you might be able to make the argument that the employee, the worker, uh, basically made the selection solely to get accident benefits. And the reason for that is accident benefits tends to be a little more generous uh, than, than the workers' comp scheme. And so if you have a situation like that where someone has, you know, they've made their election, but there isn't really an election, uh, the accident benefits insurer, uh, separate and apart from bringing that right to sue application we talked about, uh, they can always uh, bring actually uh, an application at the License Appeal Tribunal to make a determination of whether or not uh, this election was primarily for the purposes of getting accident benefits. Uh, it, it's a pretty tough bar because it's, it's a subjective test, you know, as long as they sort of believed uh, that it wasn't just for the primary purpose of SABs, uh, they'll, they'll probably be considered a valid election, but you know, you can look at various objective factors like, you know, is there a tort claim? Have they done anything with the tort claim? You know, what's going on? You know, what are the, the external factors uh, that essentially might say, oh, uh, really they made this election uh, just to do, um, just to get the accident benefits. And so it's, again, always something to look at. Uh, I think maybe the takeaway here is just uh, don't, don't necessarily trust what the, uh, the injured worker is saying. You know, they, they might be a worker and not an independent contractor. They might actually be on the clock uh, when, when they're, they're not you know, they, in the course of employment. Uh, and they may not have actually made a valid election. So all that to say in, in you know, this whirlwind of the last 27 minutes or so, is that WSIB, uh, even though we only tend to deal with a couple of sections, are really fact specific. Uh, and you know, if you dig down, sometimes there, there's coverage and sometimes that means uh, they don't get to pursue a tort claim or, or they don't get to have accident benefits. And if you're a, you know, an insurer, that that can be beneficial for you because you can sort of transfer the file elsewhere. And that sort of wraps it up for us today, other than I think we have one Q&A uh, question that I'll get to. But before then, um, in terms of next presentations, we do have one coming up on, I believe, June 1st, uh, dealing with occupier's liability uh, and what a reasonable excuse for delay is. And that's uh, with Fiona Brown and Krista Gruen from our office. Uh, it should be the same time and an invite will go out uh, in the future. Uh, but I see we do have a question here um, can anyone uh, do this clearance certificate? And so maybe Ryland, I will uh, pass that to you. Uh, yeah, and the answer is yes. Uh, it's it's uh, the website, the, the link that I have on the slide uh, should take you right to the, to the search screen and it's open to the public. All you need is generally the uh, employer's name or if you have the bin number or if you have their address, it will do an advanced search and you know nine times out of ten if you have the proper details it will come up uh, if they are registered with the WSIB or it will there will be no no results at all. But yes anyone can do it. All right. And again now is the time if anyone has any questions we've got about a minute left. Otherwise we'll be respectful of everyone's lunch hour and we can call it a day. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any other additional questions. Uh, again, feel free to reach out to Ryland or I. Uh, we're always happy to chat and you know, WSIB is just, it's kind of fun for us because you always get to dig into the facts and you can do a little bit of investigation uh, on your own. 
and we're always happy to chat and uh, the slides and presentation will be available in the uh, the future. So thanks everybody and uh, everyone have a great afternoon.